Thank you for joining us today. If you are not an ATA member, please consider joining at https colon slash slash atalink.org slash become a member. Welcome to Seminar 3, Advanced Analytics, Leading the Map Towards Data-Driven Decisions. We hope you enjoy this presentation. Views expressed in this presentation are those of the speaker and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, the Department of Defense, the United States Government, or the Airlift Tanker Association. Hello, my name is Don Anderson. I'm the Assistant Director of Analysis for Air Mobility Command A9. Um, today we're gonna to be talking about a uh, quick introduction about what we do. We're gonna do some gaming. We're gonna look at rapid app, uh, application development, uh, self-service analytics. We're gonna look at Mobility Air Force's visibility. And then we're gonna go into uh, COVID a little bit and does social distancing really work? And we're going to show you what machine learning tells you about that. I'm going to find, wrap it up with the mobility capabilities and requirements study, and then finally the GAN study. Okay, introduction. We work for the Air Mobility Command Commander, um, but we're located within Transcom. We are the lead Department of Defense analytic organization for all things airlift, all things mobility, which includes airlift, air refueling, uh, and the en route structure. Uh, we're DOD industry leaders in machine learning, and we're going to see some of that in a little bit. Rapid application development, uh, we're going to have a demonstration of that. Gaming, and then, of course, uh, cloud-based analytics. Okay, let's step into gaming. Okay, uh, AMCA9 is on the leading edge of gaming in the Department of Defense. We use uh, a commercial off-the-shelf program called Command. Uh, you can go to GameStop today and, and go ahead and buy Command. It costs $99. Um, it's used by the Marine Corps, the Army, the Air Force, and NATO. Uh, over on the left, uh, you probably can't read it, of course, but uh, we can have up to 16 players now. We can go 8v8, and we can go 16v uh, artificial intelligence, or any combination thereof. We work directly with the game developers. It's a company called Slytherin. They're out of the United Kingdom. Uh, to ensure that accurate mobility data is actually entered into this program, in fact, one of our lead analysts, uh, Mr. Pete Sable here, this is a, a clip from uh, the web. Uh, he just recently traveled over and met with the Slytherin game developers to make sure that our mobility data from both the United States Transcom and their mobility command is included into uh, the actual software. All right, uh, this is an unclassified COTS war game that will command. All right, we're going to give you a quick demonstration here in a moment. Uh, we're not obviously not going to show you six hours of, of the battle. This is a very sped up version of what you're about to see. What's important, though, is that we've teamed up with AFRL, NASIC, Half A2, and various other organizations to develop a classified version of this. This is an unclassified version that you're going to see. The classified version took that commercial game and put real threat data in, real aircraft data, real Army data, real Navy data, and we've created a really high-end, classified wargaming um, system. You can go ahead and bring up the demonstration, please. Uh, right now we're bringing up the demonstration and go ahead and start the video. And real quickly, I'm gonna go ahead, uh, this is gonna be pretty fast. Uh, but if you look, this is South Korea, North Korea. This is kind of a simulation that we built. Uh, this, these are commercial aircraft coming in up here. Uh, you can see the electronic warfare. These, those are the rings, they're threat rings. These are all the, the North Korean assets coming down into the south. You can see our F-16s are launching to, to provide seed and um, MiG sweep missions. Uh, these, these diamonds, those are missile impacts on the ground. Up here, we've got a naval task force up, up in, in this part of the world here. And you can see they're attacking some of the, the North Korean coastal uh, sites. Uh, we've got the commercial aircraft now diverting over into Japan. Uh, I'm showing you this to, to show you that we have both naval, army, Air Force, electronic warfare, and if we need to, we can actually include space into this. Um, and we'll let this run out for just a couple of minutes so you can see the complexity of it. If you want to look at what's on an aircraft, you can see all the data on here on the aircraft. It's, it's live fed. Uh, we, we capture all this data. We can analyze it later on. You can see we're bringing F-22s up from the south. Uh, we have some tankers with them, KC-135s. We've got AWACS coming into the theater. 
we've got C-17s that are uh, resupplying right now uh, in this. You can see our uh, commercial aircraft are now diverting off to the side, and we're going to use C-130s to take over their mission. Um, this actual game, if we were to play it, which, like I said, it's like between six and nine hours long. And you're seeing uh, just a, a snip of it going at super high speed. But you can see the, the land battle is, is uh, progressing pretty quickly over here. This is an armored unit from the north going across the DMZ as we speak. Uh, you can see the Boeing 747s are departing. They're going up to Elmendorf. We've got another wave of F-22s coming in right now. Uh, here's the cargo now being diverted over into Japan. I'm going to cross, transload that, bring it across over to the peninsula. So the purpose of this is to show that we are really, literally leading the world when it comes to wargaming to include mobility assets. Most war games are just the, the things that shoot the bullets, right? But you can't win that war without all of this infrastructure that's supporting it. The, the commercial airliners, the commercial cargo carriers, the C-130s, C-17s, C-5s. So let's go ahead and bring that down. And go ahead and uh, move on to the next topic. Okay, rapid application development. So this is something that's very useful. Um, when COVID hit, Air Mobility Command A9 uh, immediately built web pages and mobile phone apps to track uh, COVID, to let AMC leadership know the status of COVID throughout their AMC bases and throughout the world because we are everywhere in the world. Over on the left side, you'll see our iPhone app. Uh, we developed that in a couple of days. Uh, we have a public facing site, which you see in the middle. And then we have an Air Force Data Lab site that's protected under IL-4 security. So we, we can actually do a little bit more uh, analysis on the Air Force Data Lab site. To date, these three sites have over 30,000 views. Uh, that's, that's significant because that shows that over time, these sites are being used over and over and over again. If you look at some of the other COVID sites that the military uh, has stood up, they might be 500 views, 600 views, 700 views. Nothing compares to 30,000 views. That tells us that everybody is using this and they're using it every day. For example, many AMC-based commanders access our site to determine when to either reopen or reclose their bases. So you're looking at a look at Scott Air Force Base. On the left side is the St. Louis metro area. Those colors indicate the level of COVID uh, within the, the metro areas. Uh, that's actually as of this morning. Um, you can see, though, that Scott Air Force Base located here is in a yellow area. I'm not going to get into the details here, but you can see over on the right, it's tracking the new cases on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this is actually in the region, in the different uh, levels of opening or closing or status here. And people can tailor those to their own needs. Okay, our COVID, COVID forecasting algorithms uh, are recognized as some of the most advanced in the world. In fact, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology has taken our algorithms and they're currently updating the SEER model. The SEER model, uh, which right here stands for Susceptible, Exposed, Infected, and Recovered, is the most popular model for modeling COVID and epidemics in general in, in use in the world today. That model was developed at MIT, but our algorithms are taking it to the next step. We are using machine learning algorithms inside of the SEER model, and we can actually what if this. I'll get into a little bit more of that later on when I talk about machine learning. Uh, but the New Mexico COVID Task Force asked us a couple of weeks ago, hey, can you help us with the reopening? And so within a, a day, we sent them a lot of charts. This is just a, a small tip of what we gave them. And they're using that information to inform whether or not to open or reopen. In case you're curious, New Mexico, here's the green part. And on either side of them is not green. Okay, self-service analytics. Um, this is a big part of what we do in Air Mobility Command. This is a picture of the Air Force Data Lab. Um, to date, AMC A9, our small organization, comprised of 27 analysts, um, have posted over 1,400 data pages and links. That is over almost 25% of the entire United States Air Force cloud-based data. So you're looking at almost one quarter of everything the United States Air Force has put up into the cloud originates right here in this office. Okay, you can navigate the sites that provide almost any metric conceivable. You can see all the different views that we have up here, right? Uh, channel load factors for cargo missions, mobility Air Force's activity, C-17 dashboard for fuel efficiency, Air Mobility Command Ops Tempo, uh, C-5 uh, dashboard. But let's just take a, a gander and simulate that we clicked on the bottom right here. And so when you when you do that, this is what pops up. This is total aircraft inventory. You see all the commands are represented and all the MDSs or aircraft types are represented. 
We also have a choice over here. So each one of those tiles, when you click on it, you've got like 10, 20 different uh, views you can go in even deeper. For example, this one has total aircraft inventory by aircraft type, total aircraft inventory by command or, or, or ownership, mission capable rates by aircraft type or, or command, uh, use rates and use rates, aircraft availability rates by command, and aircraft availability rates um, by aircraft type, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to read you the whole list, but let's simulate uh, the next step into this, the next drill down. So we, we clicked on that, and you can see we have all the commands and we have all the aircraft types. All right. So the idea here would be to, uh, if you were to click again, you could choose Air Mobility Command C-17s. And this is a static picture. We'll bring up some live stuff here in a moment. But uh, if you were to mouse over that, it would give you all the stats on the C-17, Air Mobility Command, Mission Capable Rates, et cetera. So currently right now standing at about 83%. So all of this stuff is self-service analytics. You can see there's a whole bunch of other places rolling across the top there. Let's go to the next one. Now let's go ahead and bring up the actual uh, Chrome. Okay, so before we do anything here, this is a prototype that we're developing. This is a professional looking front end that is actually gonna change the way the military throws their data up into the cloud. Currently, if you were to go into the data lab, um, unless you knew where you were navigating to, it'd be really hard to find what you're looking for. But in this particular case, if you scroll down, you can see uh, you know, more views generate. And each one of these is a link into a different dashboard. Scroll back up to the top, uh, and you can choose the dashboards by clicking on that. And you can choose what you want. It looks like if you were to just click your mouse over global reach or something, you can see you can continue into that. We can also do set roles. Okay? So for example, um, the Air Mobility Command commander is going to have her own site. The Air Mobility Command vice commander is going to have his own site. It's going to be tailored specifically to what they think is important. That way they don't have to go through all the jumble. They don't have to ask their executive officers to build PowerPoint slides. Everything is right here. Um, if we were to go back to the presentation, move forward for us, please. Okay, we just talked about that. so. We'll uh, one of the other great features of this new site that we have standing up is we have presentation quality graphics. These graphics are readily available for download. I mean, this is a very high resolution graphics. You can tailor these. Let me show you how to tailor them. Uh, for example, we're looking at the uh, 62nd Airlift Wing C-17 channel missions, and that's what's highlighted here. You can download these. These are great for like leadership speeches. They're also great for presentations, for analysis. You can grab the data that, that drives these and you can pull it out into Excel sheets. You can do just about anything you like. Okay, I'm going to talk about something called Mobility Air Force's Visibility. And you'll hear the term MAPVIS, okay? If we go forward here, MAPVIS is a business intelligence app that we built that combines maintenance data, which is GO81 or ARIMAS data, with command and control data, which we use something called GDSS. Um, when we combine those two, we can present a complete picture of the entire Mobility Air Force. So this is just one snippet here. This is uh, the location of all our KC-135s color-coded by who owns that airplane. For example, the blue ones are Air Mobility Command and the red ones are Air National Guard. And you can, you can travel forward and backwards through time. This one's shown October 1st, but you can go right up to this morning on this, right? Uh, so if you want to know where are my airplanes, we can tell you where they are. Uh, go forward here. Now I click on Air National Guard, and I'm just looking at the Air National Guard KC-135s, okay? And of course, if this was live, we could mouse over there. You could get a lot of information. You can drill down into those dots, find out what the maintenance status is. Go to the next one here. Here are the KC-135s color-coded by mission type, okay? So what do we mean by mission type? We've got Air Force Reserve Command missions, Air National Guard missions, uh, combatant commander and CJCS exercises. Um, look at service missions, training missions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, let's go in a little bit deeper here. Here are the KC-135s, once again, color-coded by mission type. But we emphasize only the KC-135s that are on CJCS exercises or on combatant commander support. Really important to know what these aircraft are doing, because if we need to divert them in a hurry or uh, you know, find out who's actually consuming our resources, this is a real good way to do it. Excellent. OK. Uh, the map visibility also allows us to track ops tempo. We use something called Task to Dwell. I'm not going to get into Task to Dwell here. That's a whole other hour-long briefing, and frankly, we've run out of time. Uh, 
Uh, but here's the task did well for the air mobility command KC135. So you can see the task did well line there through here. And these are the bands 2 to 1, 2.5 to 1, 3 to 1. And the colors indicate the different kinds of missions that are sitting under there that are driving our operations tempo. And whenever we show this, we inevitably we get asked, okay, what is all these green missions? And what are all these blue missions? So we can actually differentiate this and get into a little bit deeper look onto what our aircraft are doing. So realize this is a very narrow down view. It's Air Mobility Command KC-135s, but at a click of a button, we can change to C-17s, C-5s, C-130s, KC-10s, KC-46s. Um, in this particular case, though, you can see a lot of the different mission sets that are listed over here. For example, the dark blue are air medical evacuation. Uh, we have FMS missions. We have Edwardsville test support missions. Um, all kinds of coronets, uh, special assignment airlift missions, um, alerts. Uh, so even the non-flying missions are, are included up here. But let's just say uh, the general asks, "Hey, what are my coron? I mean, sorry, what are my KC-135s? Uh, what's their support to the coronets look like?" Now, literally, this was a question that came down to us yesterday. So we just pulled this up and go ahead and show them. We just clicked on coronets, and here we are. Right? Uh, this app is is very very um, uh, agile. We could just right, we could have just right clicked over here, said keep only, and then we can get all the data that we want. We could go down to what unit supported them, how long they were on the road, their mission status, their maintenance capable status, anything you need to know about these Cornet missions, right? Sitting back here behind these colors. So this is the MAF Mobility Air Force's Visibility uh, Business Intelligence app. And this is also uh, posted up in the cloud, and we're getting quite a bit of traffic on that. The National Guard uses it, Air Force Reserve Command uses it. Air Mobility Command uses it. The Transcom Commander is very interested in this because tankers are a hot topic right now. Okay, this is what everybody's probably waiting for because this is the coolest part. Um, COVID, the social distancing really work? Um, and we use machine learning to, to dig into this. Now, uh, this is just one aspect. We use machine learning to do a lot of forecasting. Uh, I cannot get into the forecasting aspect of it because we go up into the classified realm pretty quick. But I, we did use it to look at COVID and social distancing. So this is what we found. Does social distancing really work? Well, it depends on where you live. I'm going to give you a good example of that here in a moment. Before I begin, though, we get our data from three different sources. OK, and we combine it together and run it through the machine learning software packages that we have. Our first source over on the left is mobile phone tracking data. That's provided by Google. So if you've got a mobile phone and your location services are on, we can tell that somebody visited a grocery store, somebody went into a restaurant, somebody went into a park. We have all of that data, literally hundreds of millions of data points of mobile phone data. This data is anonymized, so we can't say Don Anderson did that. We just know a phone did something, right? And it's very generalized also, so we can't kind of like weasel our way down to figure out who went into the transit station on that, on that day. So no worries there, it's, it's very safe. But we do have that data, we do have the patterns, we do have it at, a, at the county level. Our second source of data is the hospitalization and testing data. And we get that from something called the COVID Tracking Project. They have data APIs that we just automatically pull the data from and update our software with. That hospitalization data includes um, the number of people in the hospital, uh, whether they're taking an ICU bed, how long they've been there, anything you need to know about the hospitalizations. As far as the testing data goes, it has how many tests are performed each day, how much positive came back, how much negative came back, how much came back that weren't that had any results on, that kind of stuff. So we have all the testing data. Final source of data is from Johns Hopkins. Okay, Johns Hopkins, they track confirmed cases uh, and deaths. Uh, and we get that through GitHub, so it's just a, it's an easy download using an API. So our three sources for what you're about to see, mobile phone data, uh, hospitalization, hospitalization and testing data, and then finally the number of confirmed cases and the number of deaths. Okay, let me uh, slow down a little bit and show you what this really is. This is the Google phone data for Chicago. Okay, this is urban Chicago. This is downtown Chicago that I'm looking at. It's, it's known as Cook County. Um, although we have six different categories of mobile phone data, we're only using four of them for this, for this uh, example. Um, this line right here, is no change since prior to COVID. So right here, COVID hit, a lot of social distancing. So this is pre-COVID, okay? Down the, the percentage change in the number of visits for each location. For example, uh, right here, the blue line 
our visits to grocery stores, minus 20. So that means at the end of March, Chicago had reduced its visits to grocery stores by 20%. Okay, you look here, this purple line, transit stations. Okay, at the end of March, Chicago had reduced its use of public transit by over 60%. That's six zero percent Huge changes, okay? So, offers less social distancing. This is uh, no social distancing. This is uh, an increase in visits, which means even less than pre-COVID. This is an increase in social distancing or a decrease in visits to each of these categories. So the blue line are visits to grocery stores. The red line are the visits to retail stores. The orange line are workplace visits. And the purple line are transit visits. So I had to explain that to you because I'm going to compare and contrast downtown Chicago with the Chicago suburbs to answer the question, does social distancing really work? Okay, this is the same chart, but for the Chicago suburbs, okay? It looks almost exactly the same, right? Uh, with the only difference here, grocery store visits in suburban, suburbia Chicago are right back to the level they were pre-COVID, okay? People got to eat. Uh, you see, they really only decreased by about 15 to 20 percent at the peak of their decrease. However, transit use is still very low. All right, let me explain to you how we did the machine learning real quick. This is the machine learning software that we have. This is kind of like the setup page, right? This is where we bring the data in. These are all the fields that we're using to forecast forward. These are what's known as external factors. Machine learning takes these external factors, looks at the confirmed cases over this time frame, and it will tell you this visit to grocery store has a big effect on COVID cases or it has no effect or a little bit of effect, okay? Uh, these are parks, population infected, residential visits, retail visits, transit stop, uh, transit public use of transit, and then workplace visits, right? So we run these through uh, the, the machine learning. Let's go on to the next one. Every time we run this, we run it at the county level. So we hit go and we come back with 2,800 forecasts, okay? One for each county in the United States of America. Really about 2,790 forecasts. Um, for the algorithms, we're using something called Model Average Neural Network. There are three other uh, machine learning algorithms that we can pick. We find we like this one, but SVM Linear for the, the geeks out there is very popular and works really well also. The results are down here. Now let me show you what these results are. All right, this is Chicago. These are the results for Chicago. And these are what's called the variable importance. How important is each one of those external factors in determining how many COVID cases are happening and will happen in the future? Let me give you one example. Retail, percentage change from baseline. The variable importance that the machine learning assigned is 87.58, which is extremely high. So what this says is in downtown Chicago, visits to retail establishments have a direct and strong correlation to how much COVID is being um, uh, recorded, okay? Uh, you can see there's various scores for all of these. Let's go ahead and, and do a compare, a contrast. Next. All right, we're gonna look at transit use, uh, public transit use in Chicago downtown versus public transit use of Chicago suburbs. These are the transit for Chicago and the Chicago suburbs. The blue is urban Chicago, and the purple are the Chicago suburbs. DuPage County and Cook County, for those of you that live up in that area. If you look, these social distancing patterns look very similar, okay? There's just a little bit of difference here, but they're both about 40 to 60% off of pre-COVID levels even today as we look at this, okay? So the Chicago transit system, it's heavily used in downtown Chicago. In fact, many people don't have vehicles down there, all right? So you, I tried to park up there a couple of weeks ago, it cost me 50 bucks, five zero dollars. So people don't have cars. They are reliant on the transit system. That is how the people move around that area. They need the transit system to go to grocery stores. They need a transit system to go to work. DuPage County, um, not so much. The transit system is more of a luxury. I don't feel like driving today, I'm gonna to take the transit system to work. Otherwise, I can drive in and out, right? So, uh, downtown Chicago, they have to use transit. Suburban Chicago, not so much. All right, here's the results. Does social distancing work? 
in Chicago, downtown, the transit stations that are a uh, significance of 73.99. The conclusion from that is the transit system use in Chicago, social distancing there has a significant effect on the number of COVID cases they're experiencing. However, we go out to the suburbs, transit station, very important, it was excluded. Transit use in DuPage County has no effect on COVID cases in that area. So when somebody says, does social distancing really work? Well, it depends on what kind of social distancing, because in DuPage County, retail visits got a really high score. What do you mean by social distancing? Is it retail visits, is it grocery stores, is it going to work, is it using public transportation? Um, and it also depends on what county you live in. You get wildly different results depending on where you live. Okay, it's a tale of two cities. Um, Belleville, Illinois, which is where Scott Air Force Base is located, this is the transit social distancing. Belleville, Illinois transit is back to where it was pre-COVID. It's been like that since the beginning of June. Zero change in public transportation. It's not that really important around here, right? Because we're not dependent upon public transportation. But you compare that to Chicago, they are still down 40%. Big differences, right? So does transit social distancing work in Belleville? Doesn't matter because nobody's using the transit system. Right, we're back up to where we were. So we probably went from, you know, 10 riders to 20 riders. I mean, literally, that's, I'm not exaggerating. It's that little use. Okay, now we're gonna talk about something very important that you probably hear a lot about if you're dealing with the analysis world. It's called the Mobility Capabilities and Requirements Study. This study is mandated by Congress via something called the National Defense Authorization Act. This is the actual act of the fiscal year 2020, and they say, refer to this as National Defense Authorization Act. Okay, so literally, the NDAA. Within the NDAA, in section 1712, they have a section called the Mobility Capability Requirement Study. This is not something that Air Mobility Command or Transcom makes up. It's something that Congress says, go and do. Um, in this particular case, it says the commander of the United States Transportation Command is designated essentially as the lead organization for that. If you remember in the beginning of the talk, AMC A9, we report to the AMC commander, but we sit within Transcom. Because of this relationship we have, and because we are all things mobility, guess what? Air Mobility Command A9 provides that study results to the commander of the United States Transportation Command. All right, so MCRS happens every couple of years. It's mandated by Congress. On the left are the results from our latest study which was delivered in January of 2019. If you look here, for those of you that are familiar, strategic airlift, 275 aircraft. So what do we got? We got C-17s and C-5s. When you add the two fleets together, you get 275. Theater airlift, 300 aircraft. There's a lot of pressure to, to cut that fleet. Because of this, it's not getting cut. It may be a little, a little bit, but we're maintaining. Air refueling tankers, 479. That's a combination of KC-46s and KC-135s. So that determines how many KC-135s we're gonna keep and how many KC-46s we're gonna buy. So these results are used by Congress and the departments, Department of Air Force specifically, um, to size and fund our mobility enterprise. Congress will take these results and they'll put it back into the next NDAA, says you will do this, right? They'll say, you're gonna have 275 airlifters, you're gonna have 300 tactical airlifters and 479 tankers. End of story, that's how we do the fleet. So what that means is that the work performed by AMC A9 determines how many KC-135s, KC-10s, KC-46s, C-17s, C-5s, and C-130s we need in the fleet. This small organization determines the size of the mobility air force and the tens of billions of dollars that go along with funding that enterprise. The final look at that uh, that we're gonna talk about is something called the Global Air Mobility Support System, or GAMS. GAMS is a study of the en route system, okay? We got 275 C-17s and C-5s. If we were to land 30 of them at Ramstein tomorrow, can we get those aircraft fueled? Can we get the, the cargo uploaded? Can we get the passengers downloaded? That's what this study does. If we had 1,000 C-17s, it's not gonna help the war fight if you've got a little tiny choke point in Europe somewhere. That's what this study does. How big, how robust do we need the, the en route structure to be? Um, so we have fixed end-loop bases like Ramstein and Yakota, 
but we also have this thing called the contingency response, where we have groups and, and units that can roll in on an airport and turn it into a military transload location in, in, a, in a heartbeat, right? Or actually a receiving station where you can actually receive troops and weapons and everything and process them and get them out the door. We look at three core functions. We look at the aerial support, right? So that's cargo and, and the passenger process. You know, do we have the uh, forklifts? Do we have the, the K loaders? Do we have everything we need to get the stuff off the airplane? Passenger processing. Do we have a way to look at people's cat cards so we know to get off the airplane? Uh, in the world of COVID, do we have test kits, all of that good stuff? Then we look at maintenance. <clears throat> um, where do we put all of our maintenance? Do we put our C5 maintenance up in Ramstein and then flow our C5s through Spain? Well, we, we got some models that I showed you where we do a lot of flowing of, of you know, the, the wartime plans and we figure out what bases are best to support, and then we take and we look at the maintenance and we put that maintenance in those locations. Finally, command and control services, right? Sometimes they have to take over and they have to provide command and control. Air traffic control coming in, that kind of stuff. If you've stood up a base, right, how are you going to tell the airplanes when to land? Who's going to sequence them in? Uh, so deployable GAN, which is the mission response, has the additional responsibility to provide rapid deployment, Air base opening and limited base operating support. That's what BOSS stands for. Okay, so this study, this particular one, was directed by the Air Mobility Command Commander uh, and directed A9 to serve as the OPR. That's a nice way of saying A9 is in charge. Um, we are working with the Expeditionary Center, A4, A310, A58. So we're working with a lot of other organizations to figure out how to do this study. But it's a complete study. It's not just we're going to look at Yakota by itself, and then we're going to look at Ramstein by itself, something like that. So we start off with day-to-day -day steady state operations, okay? We see, can we handle the day-to-day -day operations? And then we add a surge to that, and we move our forces to 12-hour shifts. How much workload can we put through that air base? And then we do a day-to-day -day plus a surge plus what's known as a tip grid, or basically a wartime flow. How much do we need to maintain and support that base to get the troops and the, and the cargo through? Uh, in time to, to, to get to where it needs to be on time. And then, of course, anything above that, we're characterizing as risk. Over on the right side here, probably can't see it, but these are the, the inputs and these are the outputs. So passengers on aircraft, passengers off aircraft, passengers that are staying on the aircraft, not getting on or off. Cargo, can we handle oversize? Can we handle outsized? Bulk cargo, uh, rolling stock, which are vehicles, that kind of stuff. Uh, hazardous materials, backlog, frustrated, et cetera, et cetera. We look at all of these aspects of the cargo and the passengers. And then we produce an output, right? Uh, what do we need to support that? How many people do we need at Ramstein on a day-to-day -day basis? How many do we need to bring in during the wartime? Uh, frankly, there's not enough time to do all that deep thinking when something's happening. So what we generally do is we have these plans on the shelf, and it's informed by this. Uh, this is some stripped-down look at how, we do, how, we, how we're looking at this, right? But this is the base, and these are the number of days across the bottom, okay? Mod is maximum on the ground. So in this particular case, this blue line is seven airplanes. What that means is you could have seven C-17s on the ground, and this is what they call a working mod, and we can be offloading all 17 at the same time, I mean, all seven aircraft at the same time. What you don't want to have is nine airplanes land, and you've got a working mod of seven, because what happens is you start backlogging. Before you know it, your entire airfield is full of airplanes not getting offloaded. Uh, so we need to figure out what that working mod should be based on our work. Finally, this is what's called PPE, pallet position equivalence. Okay, so that last one, you know, we're looking at cargo. Now we're looking at cargo and passengers. So in order to make the analysis easy, right, we, we kind of convert people into pallet position equivalents. Like 11 people is about the same as one pallet when it comes to the amount of workload that we have. So we look at that, we look at it over time, and we size bases yeah, how we want them. Next slide. So with that, uh, as a whirlwind tour of Air Mobility Command A9, but we did talk about the gaming, the rapid application development, self-service analytics in, in, in the cloud, et cetera. Uh, our math viz app, we did a little bit of machine learning and how it applies to uh, mobile phone data and COVID. Talked about the mobility capabilities requirement study or the MCRS. And finally, we just wrapped it up with a quick look at the games. So, with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. I'd now like to turn it over to you for QA.
views expressed in this presentation are those of the speaker and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, the Department of Defense, the United States government, or the Airlift Tanker Association. All right, some of the questions that we had is, uh, can you provide an anonymous, can you provide an update on the current MCRS and are you on track to complete the study by January? So, so we, we've got an extension due to COVID on the MCRS. So three months, is that what we, so about a three month extension. So it looks like uh, sometime in the uh, mid to late spring we'll be uh, presenting. And next question, Tom. A little bit harder to communicate Does with somebody who's always- A9 in make this in-house or in is it available for other folks? Cell phone with a cell phone in his face. So it's- kind What was the question? Can you repeat that? Do you anticipate is the software in house for the study? Which software are we talking about? This is not your study. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, so I'm assuming the question was, is the MCRS study going to be available for distribution? Uh, we do distribute the, the MCRS study after completion. Uh, we do coordinate across all the departments prior to the publication of the study. All right, another question, Anonymous. Is the phone data public data, or did you pay for it via a contract with the carriers or a data aggregator? So the, the, it is public data. If you just Google, uh, Google COVID mobile phone, you'll see a link to it, and then you can download it yourself. The data is aggregated at the county level, so that's, the, that's how they keep it anonymous. You're not going to get individual phone data. You'll get it at for each county. All right, anonymous. Will the link to self-service analytic dashboards be available outside the .mil domain? Ooh. We don't. I don't know the answer to that at this time. Um, normally, it's CAC enabled, so um, you should be able to get into it even if you're not a .mil, as long as you have a working uh, military or DoD CAC card. All right, I'm going to paraphrase a question uh, with the data on uh, fuel. What is being done to better enable data collection for uh, fuel use and uh, air refuelings among various countries in the U.S. aircraft? Yeah, so that's a little bit outside of what we're looking at. So um, fuel usage, of course, for fuel efficiency, we are tracking that. I'm not sure if we're talking about aerial refueling or if we're talking about fuel efficiency. But to collect the actual fuel data, um, the maintenance forms, the GO81 forms have been altered, and we are collecting a much more robust data set uh, through the maintenance forms. Okay, that seemed to have used up our questions. Anderson, we thank you very much. Okay. Out here, thank you. If you're not an ATA member, please consider joining at HTTPS colon slash slash atalink.org slash become a member. Thank you for participating in our virtual presentation. Please close this window and return to the agenda on our website to view another presentation.